In section 5.1, we're going to be estimating with finite sums. In other words, a known amount. A train moves along a track at a steady rate of 75 miles per hour from 7 a.m. to 9 a.m. What is the total distance traveled by the train? Well, we can see this graphically. If we graph this, if x-axis is time and the y-axis is velocity, well, if the, the rate or the velocity of the train is constant the entire time, then this ends up being a rectangle. So if we find the area of the rectangle, it's like um, the dimensional analysis that we're used to. So we have 75 miles per hour. And we're going to multiply that. Here's the 75. The height of the rectangle is 75. We're going to multiply by two hours. So if you multiply by two hours, the hours cancel out, and you're left with 150 miles. So the distance traveled is the area under the curve, or this straight line. Well, if we look at a train that is changing speed as we go along, then arrives at its destination, we want to know the area of this object, but it's not a known shape, so we're going to have to come up with something else. Would the area of this irregular region still give the total distance traveled over the time interval? Sure. Newton and Leibniz, and actually many others who had considered this question, thought that it was obviously would. And that is why they were interested in a calculus for finding areas under the curve. And that's what this uh, half of the semester is going to be all about, areas under the curve. They imagined the time interval being partitioned into many tiny subintervals, each one so small that the velocity over it would essentially be constant. Geometrically, this was equivalent to slicing the irregular region into narrow strips, each of which would be nearly indistinguishable from a narrow rectangle. So they're going to take this unknown object, unknown shape, and we're going to turn it into a bunch of rectangles. And in this case, they just don't finish the rectangle. So there's the next rectangle. If we finished out the rectangles, that one, that one, that one, and there would be the last rectangle. And that's what we're going to do in this section. We're going to cut up irregular shapes into as many, into, well, rectangles. The region is partitioned into vertical strips. If the strips are narrow enough, they're almost indistinguishable from rectangles. The sum of the areas of these rectangles will give the total area and can be interpreted as distance traveled, in other words, area under the curve. They argued that just as the total area could be found by summing the areas of the essentially rectangular strips, the total distance traveled could be found by summing the small distance traveled over the tiny time intervals. So we're going to cut the entire interval into little pieces, and we're going to find the area of these rectangles, and when we add all the rectangles up, we get distance traveled, or area under, under the curve. But if we have a known amount of rectangles, this is only going to be an estimation of the area under the curve. Because there's going to be some error. There's a little bit of error, and there's a little too much area right here, a little too much area. Uh, but once again, it's just an estimation. In example one, we're finding distance traveled when velocity varies. If it didn't vary, it'd be a rectangle, and we wouldn't need all this. A particle starts at x equals zero and moves along the x-axis with velocity v of t equals t squared for time t greater than or equal to zero. Where is the particle at t equals three? Well, we're going to partition this into three partitions. And on the first one, we're going to use left Riemann approximation method. So the L is left. Uh, I'm going to make three rectangles because we're supposed to partition this uh, with three partitions. Now, if we go from 0 to 3, each partition is going to be one wide if there's three of those. So here's the first one, and now we're doing LRAM. So we're going to extend the base to be one unit long, and then I want to raise this up until it hits the curve. But in this case, it hits the curve right away. So the height of this rectangle is 0. <clears throat> then I want to extend the base of the second rectangle from 1 to 2, and I'm going to raise this one up until the left side hits the curve about right there. You can see the left side hitting the curve. Now here's the last rectangle. We're going to extend it from 2 to 3 and then raise this curve up, or this rectangle up, until it hits the curve on the left-hand side. So there it hits the left-hand side. Now we're going to use the area of these three rectangles 
to approximate the area under the curve. Now this rectangle I know has no area, but we're still going to have a process here. And the process says add the areas up of these three rectangles. So the, the base of the rectangle is one unit. And the height is the function value of zero right here. That's the height. It has no height, uh, but that's just how it worked out with the LRAM. The next area, the, the area of the next rectangle, uh, it is also one high, excuse me, one across. So it's one times f of, in this case, it's the height of the function value at one. So f of one, and then finally plus one, this third one has a width of one, and the height is the function value for two, so times f of two. Well, remember the function is x squared, so we have one times zero, plus one times one squared is one, plus one times two squared is four. So we have zero plus one plus four, and we estimate the area under the curve as five units squared. So we estimate the object to be at five, five blocks, five miles, five whatever. But it's, I think it's pretty obvious once we pointed out that there's a lot of area that we didn't cover. This is a rough estimate of what the area would be because we're missing so much area with these three rectangles. Let's look at MRAM, mid Riemann approximation method. So we're going to do the same thing. We're going to extend the base from 0 to 1 because we want three partitions from 0 to 3. And we're going to raise this up until the curve hits the middle of the rectangle, the midpoint. Same thing, from 1 to 2. Then we're going to raise this rectangle until it hits, until the curve hits the midpoint. Somewhere about right, oop, that's probably a little too low, but this is just a good idea of what's going on. Uh, and then we extend the last one from 2 to 3 and raise this up until the curve hits the middle again. So we're using a midpoint approximation. Well, the width of the rectangles are still, or the base is still one unit, but then we're times f of, the height is dictated by 0.5, or one half. In the next rectangle right here, this one, uh, the base is one, of course, and the height is dictated by the function value when we plug one and a half in. There's the height of this second rectangle. So f of, that's actually three halves and it'll be better to do improper because it's easier to square. The third rectangle is one across, or on the bottom, and then the height is the function value when we plug two halves in. It hits the midpoint right there, so f of, that's actually five halves. So we have one times uh, one half squared. Remember the function is x squared. So we have one fourth plus nine fourths plus 25 fourths. 9 plus 1 is 10, plus another 25 is 35 fourths. So this approximation turns out to be uh, 35 divided by 4. That goes in 8 times with 3 left over. 8 and 3 fourths is the approximation for this one. And we have, it's hard to tell whether this is an overestimate or an underestimate because on the left side it's not getting, it's getting more than we need, but over here we have less than what we need. So midpoint, it's hard to tell whether this is an over or an underestimate when the function is increasing. On the last one, uh, what should I pick? This one, right? We want RAM, right Riemann approximation method. And we're going to still use three partitions, so the bases are all going to be one again. Actually, I want uh, the rectangle. So here we have the base, and we're going to raise this rectangle up until the right side hits the curve, which is right there. From 1 to 2, raise this up until the right side hits the curve. And for the last one, we want to raise this rectangle until the right side, until the curve hits the right corner of the rectangle. So you can see this curve is going through the right endpoints of the rectangles. Well. Now we need to look at how are uh, the heights of the rectangles defined. So first of all, we have a width of 1 again. So 1 times f of, 
Well, the height now is dictated by the function uh, when one is plugged in. So f of one plus one times f of two, because here's the second rectangle right here, and its height is the function value when we plug two in, and then one times f of three. So this is the height of the last one. Ooh, kind of got off track there. Uh, so one squared is one, two squared is four, and three squared is nine. So nine plus four is 13, plus one is 14. And this is, when the function is increasing, our RAM will give an overestimate. This is too much area. This is a lot more area than what the actual answer would be. All right, now what if uh, we, instead of doing three partitions, we did six partitions and did LRAM? Well, let's get the rectangles out. Well, now, instead of the bases being one, the bases have to be a half to get six rectangles from zero to three. So if we do LRAM, once again, our first rectangle is going to have a height of zero because this is where uh, the left end point would be on the first rectangle. And then the next rectangle has a width of one half and then you just raise it up just a little bit. The third goes from one to one and a half and we raise it up until the left side hits right there. And we continue doing the exact same thing, making sure the widths are one half. There it hits the left side and here's the sixth rectangle. We're gonna raise that up until the left side hits the curve. It's a little off, but here are the one, two, three, four, five, six rectangles. Let's look at the first rectangle. It uh, has a width of one half, and the height is the function value at zero. The next one has a width of one half also, and we can factor out a one half. So we can write it as f of zero plus f of one half. Since we're doing left endpoints, the height will be dictated by the function value when we plug in one half, and then one, and then three halves, and then two, and then five halves, and that'll be, that's where we stop with the five halves, or two and a half. So here it is. We have f of zero plus f of one half, one, three halves, two, and five halves. Those are the function values that give the height of each of these rectangles, and I factored a one half out. Now the function is still x squared, so we're gonna square all of these values. And that's zero, so I don't include zero. That's one half, that's actually two halves. So when we square two halves, we get four fourths. Uh, three halves, and then that's going to be um, four halves. So 16 fourths, and finally 25 fourths. If you add all those up, you get 55 fourths, adding one, four, nine, 16, 25, you get 55. Uh, if we multiply by half, that makes the four eight, and 55 divided by eight is six and seven eighths, which is a decimal of 6.875, and I have a reason for turning that into a decimal, which I'll, I'll show you a little later in the video. So there's LRAM with six partitions. Well, what would it look like with six partitions uh, with MRAM, with the rectangles, uh, or the curve hitting the midpoints of the rectangles. So here's our rect here's the first one right here. Here's the first rectangle. And we have to go just up a little bit to hit the midpoint. These will become a little bit more obvious as we work our way across. So there's midpoint. Midpoint's about right there. Midpoint maybe there. Raise this fifth one up until it hits right there about midpoint. And the last one is right there. Well, the function values now are halfway from zero to one half, which is one fourth. So the widths are still a half, zero to a half. And then we have function value. The height is gonna be dictated by the fourths. So the function value for one fourth, which is only one sixteenth up, that's why it's so short. And then plus F of if this is one-fourth, this is two-fourths, this is three-fourths right here. So the height when we plug three-fourths into the function, there's the function value which dictate, dictates the height, so we have three-fourths. And then, so we have one-fourth, two-fourths, three-fourths, four-fourths, five-fourths. So F of five-fourths, so it's increasing by two-fourths. 
Now I've factored out the one half. Each of the width is one half. So we have one, three, five, seven, nine, eleven. This last one right here, this function value, is the result of plugging eleven fourths into the function. So here's the math for it. Remember that the function is x squared, so I'll be squaring all of these x's. So you get 1, 9, 25, 49, 81, 121. When you add all those together, you get 286, all of the numerators. And then uh, I just took half of 286, which is 143. You divide that by 16, you get 8 and 1 16th, which is 8.9375. All right, here's the last one of these. We're going to still have six partitions, uh, but now we're going to use our RAM. We want the right side of the rectangles to hit the curve. Now these are still a half across, because I want six partitions. I'm going to raise these up until the right side hits the curve. These are called Riemann sums, by the way. So here's the fourth one. Here's the fifth. And finally, on the last one, we have the sixth rectangle. Now the heights, well, the width, the base, they're all halves again, so I can factor a half out of this. And then the heights are dictated by the right side. So by f of 0.5 or a half, f of 1, f of 3 halves, f of 2, f of 5 halves, and finally f of 3. So here it, all, here it is written out to save a little bit of time. 1 half 1, 3 halves 2, 5 halves 3. That's all the function values that give me the heights of the rectangles. When you square all those, here's what you get. Remember, 1 is 2 halves, so you get 4 fourths. When you add all the numerators up, I got 91. That's 91 eighths, 11 and 3 eighths, which is 11.375. Well, you're going to have to know how to do this by hand, but we also have a computer program that I will get onto your calculators. And if you know how to get programs onto your calculator through the computer at home, I've also posted the program, and it's called the RAM program, R-A-M. Uh, let's take a look at that now. Well, here's a, an emulator, a calculator emulator for uh, the, the computer. And to uh, run this program that will do the same thing we just did, we have to put the function into Y1. And the function is X squared. And then you don't do anything with that. You just get back out. You quit. And if you go to program, if you've loaded the, the program onto your calculator, you can do this now. If you don't, we can uh, load it in class. Press enter, and we're going to have to press enter again to run the program. Now it's going to use the function that's in Y1. And we're going from 0 to 3. And we are using three subintervals. So when I press enter, it should give me the values that we've already calculated. And if I go back into, back into the, the three partitions, we see the same values that we see on the calculator, 5, 8.75, and 14. See 5, 8.75, and 14 for left, mid, and right. Now if I go to six partitions, look at these values, 6.875. We have 8.9375 for mid. And for our RAM, we have 11.375. Well, we can run the program again, RAM, run it again. We're going from 0 to 3, and now we want 6 partitions. And we have the same thing, 6.875, 8.9375, and 11.375.